Hello, adventurers, and welcome back to the Legend of Kalamatura uh, Omnibus Recap. Uh, this is part six of the recap, so if you want to be clued up as to what's gone on previously, please go back and watch the previous parts. Um, but if you're just joining us or you just want to see what the crack is, uh, my name is David. I am the Dungeon Master and Creative Mind behind Legend of Kalamatura. Thank you very much for, watch, for watching this and joining me on this journey. And let's get into it. So at the end of the last... Part. The Scally bag, the party of the the party known as the Scally bags, had completed their dungeon crawl through the Undyne Prince's necromantic lair, and had arrived at their laboratory. Uh, entered into a brief parlayer discussion, uh, during which the Lich said that he wanted to help. He wanted to kill Jeremiah Doyle, who the party have a vested interest in killing as well. After he slew one of the party members. Uh, but the price of 10,000 souls. The party initially, very briefly, thought about it and then realized, you know what, no, that's, that's, we can't agree with this. Opened fire and combat ensued. Uh, the Undying Prince, the powerful necromantic wizard sorcerer that he was, throwing very powerful high level spells at the party while taking the brunt of the party's assault. Uh, the Marlith bodyguard. Also diving into the fray and harassing the party, and while Bjorn, using his his warhammer with his radiant might and smite, realized that his radiant smites weren't damaging the Marlith; they were healing the Marlith. Realizing that radiant damage against the Marlith wasn't doing well, they tried to focus efforts against the Undying Prince. Uh, the Prince taking the damage, but realizing. He might not win this fight, uh, threw up a cloud kill to kind of obscure the battlefield, which allowed him and the Marlith, the Marlith to break away from the, the, the combat that it was locked in and rush across the chamber and within a, with, and within a single turn and seven attacks, cut down Duchess, the party's cleric. Cut her down and leave her bleeding out dead on the floor. Uh, the Undying Prince then used a power word stun on the Nesco to stop him from preventing an escape. The party then, he then made his way over. And as a final parting gift, the, Nes uh, the Undying Prince did a fireball at the rest of the party, knocking several of them unconscious and knocking low unconscious, dealing yet more damage. But the Undying Prince and the Marlith fled, fled. The part of the cloud kill dissipates, and the party are able to see Duchess dead on the ground, and the rest of them have taken an absolute kicking. In their grief and anger, the party process what's happened, trying to figure out what we do we do now, because Duchess is dead, none of us can bring her back. The Nesco is in the corner of the room, smashing a bookcase up, full of rage and fury. And as Modius appears to him, saying to him that I can bring your friend back, do we have a deal? With no other option, the Nesco accepts the deal. At which point, as Modius appears, the rest of the party walks over to Duchess and brings her back with a true resurrection. Realizing what's happened, the party, the loss of a friend, and then bringing her back, and Duchess realizing the terms of how she came back, has now got a personal quest to find a way out of, to find a way to reverse whatever pact Dinesco has made. Uh, but the party, glad to survive, and knowing that the Undying Princess has escaped, uh, leave the lair. And upon resting, make their way, begin to make their way east in through the wastes towards uh, Ariadne's home village of Zephyr, the monk colony that I mentioned previously. Uh, along their journeys, they come across uh, a party of monks of Zephyr, uh, some of the guards who had been out on patrols, who were doing battle with this green dragon sphinx hybrid creature. Uh, they do battle with the creature, they help them slay the beast, and also the number of allies of the beast had hidden nearby. 
dispatch them and realize that the Defiant are very much active in the area. And that there is, they have plans for Zephyr. Uh, revealed to be in the form of an ancient red Draco Lich that the Undying Prince and Jeremiah Doyle have ordered to be sent in that direction. Armed with this information, the party make their way to Zephyr and are brought before the elders who, take in the news, listen to it, and conduct a seeing ritual whereby they seek to validate the party's claims. Within the scene ritual, the party they are able to, the elders in the party are able to visually sort of send this orb far to the north to look at the sacred site of the Zephyr, uh, a site known as the Fingers, uh, which is formed in a valley between two rifts to the, to the elemental rifts to the plane of ice and the plane of wind. Uh, further north than that, they do indeed see the approaching fiery storm of the Dracolich Ardiat, the Scorcher of Dreams. Seeing this, the elders realize the threat is real, so they will send whatever aid they need with the party and order the evacuation of the village should the party fail. The next day, the party set forth on Pegasus' back. After Ariadne has a brief reunion with some of her, some of her family members. Uh, and as part of the evacuation, she hands her coin purse to her mother and father and says, look after the family. And leaves without a glance back, believing that she is marching to her death. Uh, the party acquire several potions of fire resistance and other magical items, which they believe will aid them in the fight. <clears throat> and... Once more, jump on their Pegasus, head north, and wait for the dragon to approach. At dawn on the second day, they are waiting the valleys. Bjorn uses his familiar Aeol to scout and sees the dragon very rapidly approaching. Uh, with but a few moments to prepare, the party cast some last-minute preparations and buff spells before the gargantuan Dracolich slams down into the middle of the valley and begins to rip and tear into the party. The party charge forth Bjorn, Low, and the head of village security, Umnak, the Goliath monk, all three of them harassing forth, even Donesco get involved in the fray. All of these people charging forward and hacking into the vast undead form of Ardiat, who soaks up the damage and doesn't really seem to care. Already out there with impunity, flies around the map, begins to hack into the party members, using his fire breath and his wing attack and his tail, and is just almost enjoying himself in this orchestra of chaos that he's bringing to bear. At one point, he almost brings Bjorn low, bringing him to like less than 10 hit points at one point. Had I rolled higher on the damage rolls, he would have been down, but you know, um, Duchess uses her new, very high level heal. Spell to restore 70 hit points, making her Ardiat's target. Before Ardiat can bring his fury to bear upon the cleric, uh, Ariadne, uh, using a harness that she had constructed, uh, has stationed, has managed to leap onto the back of Ardiat. And much like uh, the harnesses that tree surgeons use to climb tall trees or lumberjacks, she has now attached herself to the back of the dragon. She uses her full astral, brings her full astral might to bear in the form of a massive spectral bear, tears into the back of the dragon, the undead Dracolich. In doing so, manages to paralyze the creature, paralyze its wings so it can no longer fly. With its flight lost, Ardiad is forced into a ground a uh, ground-based campaign where the party are quite simply able to massively outclass it. Um, after the previous onslaught and sensing the end, Bjorn brings forth uh, the golden draconic form that he has been that he had been bestowed previously after slaying Udasil and having the dragon soul bound to his own. With this form and with the rest of the party's might and fury, Ardiad is torn asunder and slain. 
and the day is saved. The fingers are saved, damaged, but secure. And the party, in the knowledge that the battle could have gone very differently, are glad to have survived. But in the process of this battle, Donesco had to call upon Asmodeus to aid them, which ultimately helped, but who knows what who knows what consequences that will have in the long term. But the party saved the day. The dragon was slain, the village was saved, and the secret site was, while damaged, still kept intact. So the party returned to Zephyr. Uh, met the column of reinforcements that were marching up to try and help them. All returned to the village. The refugees were called back. And over the course of that, the rest of the day, the evacuees returned. And a massive celebration was had. The whole village coming together to celebrate victory and their continued survival. But all involved realized how isolated Zephyr is and how vulnerable it is. And the elders are left wondering what is in store for the future of the village and how sustainable their way of life is. And the party reflect on the efforts of the last few days and they're also their recent new responsibility. Um, when they arrived at Zephyr and their, when they were briefed with the elders and their preparations they were received, they were visited by the spymaster of the council, Angela Wilder, who informed them that after the Jeremiah Doyle incident, uh, the council had taken a look into the party. The party members had researched them, looked into them, and taken account of the deeds of the last three months, had decided to honour the party and name them Knights of the Realm, effectively dubbing them the protectors of the Council of Mentura, giving them medallions of office which apart from being a, a title and a promotion, comes with, obviously comes with money and reward, but also the weight of responsibility and access to the teleportation network of the council, which is basically fast travel. But that's where we end my recap, the Omnibus recap, which is almost three years, two and a half years in game, two and a half years, 51 sessions. And now we start 2024 with the party in the aftermath of the battle, planning their next steps, trying to hunt down, continue the hunt for Jeremiah Doyle and the Defiant, and just wondering what exactly it means to be a knight of the realm and wondering what the future holds them as they are now all level 15. They've leveled up several times. I just don't mention it because it's an omnibus recap. But yeah, party now level 15. Uh, we're starting 2024 next week at time of recording. And hopefully by the time of uploading. And I am going to try and be much better. So look, keep an eye on the channel. Uh, every couple of weeks there'll be a, hopefully a new recap going up. Where I'll recount the episode, the, the events of the session. Everything that's happened. But thank you guys for sitting with me. This is part six. <laughs> And I, honestly, at one point I thought this was going to be much longer, but decided to speed it up around part four because it was taking far too long. But here we are. Thank you very much for sticking with me all the way to the end, guys. And I look forward to seeing you all for the rest of 2024 and beyond. Thank you all very much for watching Adventurers, and I will catch you in the next update. See ya.